Thank you to Audible for sponsoring today's video. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment, including a wide variety of audiobooks. Audible members can select one title in unlimited monthly Audible originals each month. In addition, they have access to an extensive library of additional content available just for members, ranging from podcasts to guided health and wellness programs. I have currently been listening to an Audible original podcast, Heist with Michael Caine. I admittedly decided to give it a listen because I like Michael Caine as an actor and enjoy his voice, but it is a very well-produced podcast that tells some astounding stories of thefts from around the world. I particularly enjoyed the third episode, about the Transylvania University rare book heist. I have trouble getting and staying asleep, especially with all of the stresses associated with this year, so I have also been taking advantage of Audible Sleep. Audible Sleep provides several categories of audio experiences, designed to help you get to sleep, wake refreshed, and meditate. If you would like to receive a free month of Audible, which includes one free audiobook and unlimited monthly Audible originals, simply visit audible.com slash heavycasefiles or text heavycasefiles to 500-500. Thank you. Sixty-two-year-old Miyuki Harwood worked as a computer systems analyst for Intel. In 2015, she moved from Orangevale, California to Folsom, California. In her spare time, she loved to be outdoors. She was a knowledgeable and experienced backpacker and hiker. Miyuki was very independent and normally went on hikes and backpacking trips alone. In June of 2015, she went on a solo hike of the Grand Canyon. That August, however, she decided to go on an eight-day group backpacking trip with the Sierra Club that would go through the Sierra National Forest and Kings Canyon National Park. Miyuki did not know anyone else going on the trip. On August 20th, the sixth day of the trip, the group went on a hike up Black Cat Mountain in the Sierra National Forest. Miyuki's fellow hikers last saw her around 1 p.m., but she then became separated from them. When the group could not find Miyuki on their own, they notified authorities that she was missing. Fourteen different agencies would eventually be a part of the effort to find Miyuki. Sixty search and rescue workers combed the area for her, and search dogs, helicopters, and a drone were all utilized. The search effort was complicated by a nearby fire, referred to as the Rough Fire, which had started at the end of July and was burning just ten miles from the search area. The fire impacted air quality and complicated helicopter flight. Miyuki's sister-in-law traveled to the area during the search, and her brother flew in from Japan. Miyuki's disappearance was made even more painful for them by its timing. She went missing near the 10-year anniversary of her husband Brett's unexpected death. On August 29th, nine days after Miyuki disappeared, a group was searching near the Courtright Reservoir when they heard the sound of a whistle in the distance. They followed the sound and finally found Miyuki, signaling for help with a whistle at the bottom of a rocky ravine. She was injured and unable to walk, so she had to be airlifted out of the area. The fire made it difficult for a helicopter to land in the area, but it was eventually able to successfully reach her. Miyuki was then airlifted to Community Regional Medical Center in Fresno, where she underwent the first of two surgeries she would require on her legs. After she was rescued and brought to the hospital, Miyuki released a letter explaining the circumstances that left her alone in a remote area for over a week with limited supplies. Miyuki reached the summit of the mountain with the rest of her group, but wanted to get back to their campsite, so she decided to head back down the mountain alone, a decision which she regretted. She got lost and eventually fell off of a small cliff after it got dark. She hit the ground below feet first, shattering her left leg breaking her right ankle, and sustaining a compression fracture in her spine in the process. She remained conscious, and thought that if she rested where she fell overnight, she would be strong enough to make it back to the campsite the following day. In the morning, however, she realized that she was still completely unable to walk. While Miyuki was on an eight-day excursion, the trek up Black Cat Mountain was essentially a day trip for the group, and Miyuki's main, large backpack was back at the campsite, and she only had what could fit in her smaller backpack with her. She had little food beyond small items like nuts and a one-liter water bottle. 
The bottle was almost empty by the day after her fall, and she knew she could not survive long without finding a source of water. Luckily, she could hear the sound of water flowing nearby. She spent the next two days dragging herself across the ground to reach a creek. She had a water filter with her and was able to use it to refill her water bottle every day. Temperatures dropped substantially at night, and Miyuki was only wearing a medium-weight jacket. She was able to pull herself into the sunlight during the day to warm up. Miyuki knew that people were out looking for her during her ordeal. She saw and heard the search helicopters starting the day after she was separated from her group, but had no way to signal them, and they were unable to see her. She had previously heard another group of searchers calling for her, and had used her whistle to try to get their attention, but they had not heard her. Miyuki's injuries were serious, but not life-threatening. She had to spend some time in a physical rehabilitation center as a part of her lengthy recovery. In January of 2016, the Fresno County Sheriff's search and rescue team received a commendation for their work during Miyuki's rescue. Miyuki, still requiring crutches, was in attendance at the ceremony. She was reunited with some of her rescuers, most of whom she had not seen since she was rescued. She thanked them for not giving up on her and for saving her life. Twenty-two-year-old Rachel Lloyd graduated from North Carolina State University in December of 2015. Before beginning her graduate studies in interpersonal communication at the University of Texas, she moved to New Zealand to study at Massey University in Palmerston North for a semester. In April of 2016, her mother, Carolyn, of Charlotte, North Carolina, flew to New Zealand to visit her. On April 26th, Rachel and Carolyn embarked on a hike along the Kapakapanui Track and Tararua Forest Park, a conservation park in the Wellington region. The track takes, on average, six to eight hours to hike, and one of the best viewpoints in the park is at the summit of Kapakapanui. Both mother and daughter were experienced day hikers. Rachel and Carolyn followed orange trail markers up to the summit, and then spent some time enjoying the sun before heading back down. However, at some point during their descent, they started seeing blue trail markers instead of the orange ones. They decided that they must be an alternative way back down. They would later learn that they were not. The blue markers were there to track possums. 20 minutes into their hike down, Rachel and Carolyn stopped seeing the blue markers. However, the terrain they had covered was far too steep for it to be physically possible for them to go back the way they came. Therefore, they continued on, trying to get back to the main track. Rachel and Carolyn instead eventually ended up on a small ledge that overlooked a 600-foot waterfall. It was beginning to get dark, and the overnight temperature dropped down to around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Rachel and Carolyn clung on to each other to try to stay warm, and held onto a tree, trying to stay awake, out of fear that they would roll down the steep terrain if they fell asleep. When the sun was up enough for them to navigate through the dense vegetation that surrounded them, they climbed down the ledge. At the base of the waterfall, they found a creek, and decided to follow it. Unfortunately, Rachel slipped on a rock along the creek. She fell into the cold water and hit her head on a rock underneath the water. In addition to the head injury, Rachel also had to deal with hypothermia, which quickly began to set in. She could never get dry, and therefore could never get warm, after the fall. Rachel and Carolyn only had a limited amount of cheese and nuts they had packed for what they had thought would be just a day trip, and tried to ration their limited food supply, but the lack of proper calories made the injured Rachel even more weak. Rachel eventually could no longer see or hear, and started losing feeling in one of her legs. Carolyn then carried their backpack on her front, and carried her daughter on her back for as long as she could. By the third day of their ordeal, Rachel could no longer keep going. Carolyn made a makeshift campsite and a bed made out of fern fronds for her daughter. Rachel's condition deteriorated to the point where she believed herself to be close to death, and she relayed her dying wishes to her mother. As devastated as she was at the sight of seeing her child in such a condition, Carolyn was not about to give up on trying to save Rachel. Using branches and leaves, Carolyn wrote out the word HELP in giant letters, once in a clearing and once in an open area by the creek, in hopes that a passing aircraft would eventually see it. There were aircraft in the area, and they were there looking for Carolyn and Rachel. Carolyn's husband and Rachel's father, Barry Lloyd, was at home in North Carolina, 
but had been in contact with his wife throughout her trip so far. He became concerned when a day passed without him hearing from her or their daughter. Local authorities also became involved when Rachel and Carolyn failed to return their rental car or check into a hotel, as planned. The rental car was found at the conservation park two days after the mother and daughter began their hike, and a search began for them. All-terrain vehicles, search dogs, and helicopters were all brought in as part of the effort. Official search and rescue workers, as well as numerous volunteers, helped look for Rachel and Carolyn. Barry Lloyd remained in contact with the emergency personnel in New Zealand, and his sons had flown to Charlotte from Chicago, and were getting ready to fly to New Zealand with him to help with the search. A helicopter from Amalgamated Helicopters flew search teams into the park on April 30th, leaving them at different vantage points to look for the missing mother and daughter. The pilots then flew over the area to look for Carolyn and Rachel themselves. In the process, they saw Carolyn's messages and relayed the location to the search teams. On the fifth day of their ordeal, Rachel and Carolyn were airlifted out of the park and taken to Wellington Hospital. While Carolyn was weak, she did not need to be admitted to the hospital. Rachel's injuries and hypothermia did require a hospital stay. She would later say that she believed she would have only survived for a few more hours had she not been rescued and given medical attention. After she was released from the hospital, Rachel remained in New Zealand to complete her semester of studies. Carolyn's brother, John Schumacher, released a statement on behalf of the family after the rescue. My entire family wishes to express our tear-filled gratitude to all the amazing police staff, helicopter pilots, search team members, dog guides, volunteers, and news teams who kept us informed, and everyone else involved who worked so quickly and efficiently to find and save my sister and niece, it read. What a testament the wonderful citizens of New Zealand are to the rest of the world, of how people can work together to accomplish such noble deeds. Thank God and thank you all. Seventy-seven-year-old Carol Kiparski and her 72-year-old husband, Ian Irwin, lived in Palo Alto, California. They were both respected academics. Carol was a linguist and author, and Ian was a noted Parkinson's researcher. They lived in a very tight-knit neighborhood and were very active in their community. A neighbor described them as aging hippies, who had a holistic approach to most aspects of their life and were passionate about various progressive causes. In February of 2020, the couple rented a vacation cottage near Inverness in Marin County, California, through Airbnb. They had stayed in this cottage before, and were familiar with the area and its nearby trails. They were due to check out of the cabin on Saturday, February 15th. However, when a housekeeper arrived to clean the cottage that day, Carol and Ian were not there, but all of their belongings, including their car, wallets, and phones, were. They missed an appointment the following day, and then later failed to keep plans with their family, which was highly unusual. The last sighting of the couple before their disappearance was around 4 p.m. on February 14th, as they were walking along a road in Inverness. Based on where they were seen, they could have been heading to area trails in the Tamales Bay State Park, or to the trails that would take them down to Tamales Bay itself. As such, both land and water searches were undertaken, lasting 10 to 12 hours per day. Helicopters, drones, and search dogs were all used. Hundreds of people looked for the missing couple in the following days. Authorities had reason to believe that Carol and Ian could still be alive, even after a few days, and a cold snap that had dropped the temperature to just below freezing on several of the nights they were missing. They were both experienced hikers with specialized skills. Ian had a background in mountaineering, and Carol was an herbalist and mushroom hunter. Their optimism finally started to wane by February 20th, when the Marin County Sheriff's Office announced that they were considering the search a recovery effort rather than a rescue. Carol and Ian each had a son from a previous relationship, and each of them also began accepting the possibility that they might need to hold a memorial service and hoping that they could at least find bodies to bury so that they could have some sense of closure. Two days after that announcement was made on Saturday, February 22nd, More than a week after the couple went missing, 60 people were still out searching for them. Around 10 a.m., a three-year-old golden retriever named Groot, with the California Rescue Dog Association, led volunteers into an area of thick vegetation in the creek drainage leading to Shallow Beach. There, they found Carol and Ian. 
Ian was lying on top of thorny bushes and poison oak to protect Carol, who was without shoes, from being exposed to them. Both Carol and Ian were grateful and relieved when they saw the volunteers, who gave them their own gear to warm them up, and enough food and water to keep them strong through their transport out of the area. They were airlifted to a local hospital, where they were reunited with their sons. Despite the fact that they had both only been wearing mid-weight jackets, they only suffered from mild hypothermia. They both had numerous cuts and scratches from the dense vegetation in the woods. Carol and Ian had gone out to watch the sunset on Valentine's Day, and had taken none of their hiking equipment with them because they planned to only be gone for half an hour. However, they got lost on a trail in the woods in the dark, and eventually fell. They tried to continue on, but became essentially trapped in the thick bramble. Carol eventually lost her shoes in deep mud, and Ian lost his eyeglasses and hearing aids. They had spent the last four days of their ordeal in the spot where they were eventually found, surviving off of muddy water from a nearby puddle and the edible parts of a nearby fern. They were not far from a road, but were unable to reach it because the vegetation had grown too thick to fight through. Carol and Ian were both in good spirits as they were rescued and during their hospital stays. Their family issued a statement expressing their gratitude for all of the people who had participated in the search. Their neighbors decorated their house to welcome them home after they recovered from their eight-day ordeal.